everyone. Today we're going to be talking about gas exchange. So um, pay attention and we'll be talking and applying what you're learning right now in class on Tuesday. Um, but I wanted to be able to go over all of this with you ahead of time. So um, when we talk about gas exchange, uh, we're going to be discussing the concept. We're going to look at some assessments related to oxygenation. We're going to discuss abnormal findings of ventilation, diffusion, and perfusion. We're going to be talking about how to implement a nursing care plan, how to develop one. And um, we're going to talk about some interrelated concepts to oxygenation. So as you can see here, um, this is from your Giddens book. Um, the Giddens book is concept 19 is gas exchange. And you can see how gas exchange, impaired gas exchange, or if anything's going on with gas exchange, it can affect anxiety, it affects the acid base balance, perfusion, and you can see perfusion is back and forth. So perfusion affects gas exchange, gas exchange affects perfusion. The gas exchange can also lead to fatigue, mobility issues, nutritional issues. Um, so it's and there's many, many more. Um, oxygenation and gas exchange really uh, go down to the core of most body processes, and so therefore it's involved in most things. So gas exchange, when we talk about gas exchange and oxygenation, a lot of people will try to use these um, interchangeably, but they're not. Gas exchange is the process by which the oxygen goes to the cells and the CO2 is transported from the cells. So we're exchanging. We're giving one, we're taking the other. And um, so oxygenation is just the delivery of oxygen to the cells and the tissues in the body. And that is carried on by, that is supplied by the respiratory system and then transported to the, by the cardiovascular system and uh, by perfusion. So you can see that they're similar and a lot of people will use them interchangeably, but they are not. So um, let's just watch this quick review of the respiratory system. I think most of you um, know the respiratory system, but this is just a quick uh, reminder. Air first enters the body through the mouth or nose and quickly moves to the pharynx or throat. From there, the air passes through the larynx or voice box and enters the trachea. The trachea is a strong tube that contains rings of cartilage that prevent it from collapsing. Within the lungs, the trachea branches into a left and right bronchus, which further divide into smaller and smaller branches called bronchioles. The smallest bronchioles end in tiny air sacs called alveoli, which inflate during inhalation and deflate during exhalation. Gas exchange is the delivery of oxygen from the lungs to the bloodstream and the elimination of carbon dioxide from the bloodstream to the lungs. It occurs in the lungs between the alveoli and a network of tiny blood vessels called capillaries, which are located in the walls of the alveoli. Here, you see red blood cells traveling through the capillaries. The walls of the alveoli actually share a membrane with the capillaries. That's how close they are. This makes it possible for oxygen and carbon dioxide to diffuse or move freely between the respiratory system and the bloodstream. Oxygen molecules attach to red blood cells, which travel back to the heart. At the same time, the carbon dioxide molecules in the alveoli are blown out of the body with the next exhalation. Gas exchange allows the body to replenish the oxygen and eliminate the carbon dioxide, both of which are necessary for survival. Okay, so that was just a quick review of our respiratory system and the process of diffusion and gas exchange. So just as a quick recap, you can see the anatomy through the upper airway, down through the lower airway, all the way to the alveoli. Um, Remember that the act of breathing um, is a negative pressure system. So the diaphragm actually contracts in order for us to take a breath in. And then as it relaxes, that's how we breathe out. Okay. So um, some important things to understand when we start talking about gas exchange. So ventilation is the process of moving gases in and out of the lungs. Um, ventilation is the movement of air. It's the process of breathing in and breathing out. Inspiration is active. Um, it is because the chemoreceptor in the aorta says, hey, you need to take a breath. Our oxygen levels are dropping. We need to take a breath in. Okay. It's active. The muscle contracts. We take a breath in. Expiration is passive. Okay. Um, it's the relaxation of the diaphragm and then the elasticity of the lung tissue because it's stretched out when you were breathing in. As it relaxes back, um, it requires little or no muscular work to breathe out. If it is requiring muscular work to breathe out, you have an impairment somewhere in the system. Uh, surfactant is a chemical that's naturally produced in the lungs and um, it, ca it causes the it prevents the collapse of the alveoli uh, during ventilation so in other words when you breathe out those little uh, alveoli or what i call the grapes they don't collapse it decreases the surface tension and it keeps them open atelectasis uh, is what happens when the um, alveoli actually collapse so when you talk about a collapsed lung that's really a collapsed alveoli not an endothorax um, atelectasis uh, prevents gas exchange. So for whatever reason, the secretion sitting on the outside, the obstruction, whatever happens, the VLI have uh, collapsed and can no longer exchange gas. Diffusion is the exchange of gases across the alveoli. You saw in that video that the capillary membranes are so close there that the oxygen flows in freely and the CO2 flows out freely. They just cross back and forth evenly. And then last of all, perfusion is the ability of the cardiovascular system to pump the oxygenated blood and then return the deoxygenated blood from the system back to the lungs. And so um, we will cover that more when we get to uh, perfusion, the concept of perfusion. So impaired gas exchange, this is any condition that affects cardiopulmonary functioning um, 
and thereby directly affects the ability of the body to meet oxygen demands. Okay, so in other words, if we can't ventilate, then we cannot meet the body's oxygen demands. And there are several things that could make that happen. There's physiological factors, developmental factors, lifestyle, environmental factors. All these things can um, cause impaired gas exchange in the body. Um, physiological factors would be anything that would cause like a decreased oxygen, oxygen carrying capacity, hypovolemia, because uh, there's no red blood cells to carry carry it, um, decreased inspired oxygen concentration. That's like um, being in high altitudes, things like that. Um, conditions that affect the chest wall, uh, the movement of the chest wall, whatever you can think of that would prevent that. Obesity, neuromuscular disease, traumas, um, chronic diseases like emphysema, they change the shape of the chest wall and they flatten the diaphragm and that can impair our um, ability to exchange gases. Developmental factors could be anything from, you know, infants and toddlers being at a higher risk for respiratory infections to the older adults and normal physiological change or changes where they have decreased muscle strength um, and de decreased depth of respiration. Lifestyles, smoking, eating certain foods, environmental, exposure to allergens or lack of clean air or air quality, all of those kind of things, okay? So I want you to pause the video and I want you to think of five diagnoses or five diseases that you can think of. Think of people that you know um, that five different diagnoses that could lead to impaired gas exchange. So um, instead of playing the Jeopardy music, if you will pause it, jot down just five quick diagnosis and then we will move on. So hopefully um, your mind went to some of the things that you have already seen in life. Um, maybe not. Maybe it's things you've seen on TV or things you've heard about. All of these things can affect um, gas exchange and cause impairment of gas exchange. And there's many, 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 many more. These are just a few that I just jotted down from things listed in your book to things I've seen. So some of them are mechanical in nature, like upper airway obstruction. Some of them are pathophysiological in nature, like Guillain-Barre syndrome, um, polio. All of these things can affect gas exchange. So when we start talking about alterations in respiratory functioning, there's two things that um, there's hypoventilation and there's hyperventilation. And both of these are alterations, okay? And they lead to hypoxia and cyanosis, okay? So we're going to talk about these things um, and kind of move through and see if we can see the relationship. So hypoventilation is the alveolar ventilation is inadequate to meet the body's oxygen demand or to eliminate sufficient carbon dioxide, okay? So there's lots of different ways this can happen. Um, hypoventilation could be mechanical in nature, um, like they can't, they have obstruction, they can't get air in, so therefore they can't get rid of the CO2. Um, that's all of your CO2 uh, retaining diagnoses like COPD and asthma, um, atelectasis, where you have the collapse of the alveoli and they're unable to uh, allow gas exchange at the alveolar level. So all of these things can cause, um, can cause hyperventilation, okay? They just, they can't, the body cannot get enough oxygen in and get the CO2 out, okay? Um, and we've already talked about, if you remember when we did, at the very beginning when we talked about oxygen and safety with oxygen, and this is very important, that um, in COPD, too much, giving them too much O2 can be fatal. And if you remember, that's called the hypoxic drop. And that's when um, people with COPD, um, their bodies have adjusted to higher CO2 levels, and so they, were, they have adjusted to less oxygen. So giving them oxygen greater than about one to three liters can actually make the body think that it has enough oxygen and then basically it just um, the body just doesn't stimulate breathing and so they will become they will continue to hypoventilate and then eventually it can lead to death so what does hypoventilation look like so in the hospital other than just taking shallow breaths which is the obvious hypoventilation um, you might see decreased oxygen saturation levels you see shallow breathing they might be coughing because if you're coughing you're not able to ventilate adequately um, you're only really getting out it's hard to get in you might have adventitious breath sounds so in pneumonia or atelectasis you hear the crackles in there from the um, consolidation uh, affecting the airways you might see mental status changes as the oxygen levels change um, Dysrhythmias, the heart rhythms may change, and then potentially, if left untreated, it's eventually going to lead to cardiac arrest, okay? So uh, convulsions and consciousness death, I mean, this is pretty serious. You think about um, people just slowing down their breathing until they quit, okay? That's kind of what this is. Hyperventilation um, is when the body is getting rid of too much CO2, okay? Um, and in order to get rid of that CO2, the CO2 is building up in the body, and in order to get rid of it, the body breathes faster, okay? So when CO2 increases in the body, <clears throat> the rate and the depth of the respirations um, increase. And you can see this with things like anxiety. If you've ever heard of breathing in the paper bag, that's what they're trying to do. They're breathing too fast. They're breathing off too much CO2. So the idea behind it was to get them to rebreathe some of their CO2. Um, fever can cause this. Drug overdoses can. Fluid and electrolyte um, imbalances and acid-base imbalances can cause this. Um, and one of the um, 
biggest thing that we see is something called Kussmaul breathing. Um, and this is a rapid respiration. It's like sighing breaths. Their exhalation is longer than their inhalation. And that makes sense if you think about what they're trying to do. They're trying to breathe off the CO2 levels, which are um, acidic. And we'll learn about that in acid base. But they're trying to breathe off CO2. And so the respirations get more rapid and they get deeper. Okay. And you see this a lot with diabetic ketoacidosis. And um, with diabetic ketoacidosis, I actually have a fruit smell to the, to the uh, breath. But the Kussmaul breathing pattern is what um, you need to know. And um, so that's called Kussmaul's respirations. Now, otherwise, it it's causes numbness and tingling of the hands and feet, lightheadedness. Eventually, they pass out. Um, again, if you just think of breathing in that plastic bag and when people get so anxious and so much anxiety, they breathe off so much CO2 that um, it just makes them feel lightheaded and dizzy. So let's just watch this to see what Kussmaul's breathing pattern, what this pattern might look like. Okay, so Monica, we can respond to the some video here. office. He's 10 years old, and the hear is breathing. This is like food more breathing. This is the breathing that you're seeing with diabetic ketoacidosis. You're losing all the you You're going to wake up, but it's going to be pretty severe. And that's a weight loss, and then you can have some vomiting. Okay, so what you saw there was he was breathing fast, and he was breathing deep. And he was breathing, his exhalation was longer than his inhalation. And that's because he's trying to push those last levels of CO2 out of his lungs. Okay. Okay. So next let's talk about the results of either hypoventilation or hyperventilation. Okay. So once you have a deficiency of oxygen at a cellular level, okay. So we're talking about at cell, cellular level, then that is called hypoxia. You will sometimes hear the word hypoxemia, but that means decreased oxygen level, oxygen level in the blood. Hypoxia is deficiency of O2 at a cellular level, okay? So it's all those things that we talked about that could impair gas exchange. The lower O2 comparing capacity of the blood, such as in hypovolemia, anemia, uh, diminished con uh, concentration of inspired O2. So when you live in Colorado, there's not as much oxygen in those higher altitudes. Um, tissues cannot extract O2 from the blood and things like cyanide poisoning where they block the use of oxygen by in the body. Decreased diffusion in the alveoli, such as in pulmonary and atelectasis. Remember that diffusion is the um, ease of oxygen and CO2 exchanging in that capillary. And if something's blocking it, such as in pneumonia or atelectasis, then that's going to lead to hypoxia. Poor perfusion, such as shock, um, anything that impairs the ventilation, trauma, fractured ribs. Um, again, if it was severe enough, obesity. Um, if they're, that's a lot, a lot of times they can't lay flat on their back. Okay. So all of those things can cause hypoxia. Now, what does hypoxia look like in the clinical setting? They're going to be apprehensive, restless. They can't really concentrate. They might have altered level of consciousness, dizziness, behavioral changes. Um, just think about somebody that cannot get air. We call that air hungry. Um, if you've ever seen anybody, think of somebody that you've seen having an asthma attack, the worst asthma attack you've ever seen, and how they just, their eyes get real big, they're scared, they, and it doesn't help their breathing at all. And sometimes you just have to try to calm them down the best you can until help arrives. But um, but those are the kind of pictures you see with hypoxia. They can't lie flat because they feel like they can't breathe. You'll start to see increase in pulse and respiration rate and depth, and eventually it leads to cyanosis. Now, cyanosis is the blue coloration of the skin and mucous membranes. Remember that in your darker skin tones that you might not be able to see it as easily, easily through the skin like you can in these, but um, you would check like mucous membranes in the cheeks and gums. Uh, nail beds, you can also see it in nail beds. So um, you would want think of your assessment strategies and how you would assess for that, okay? All right, so this is, uh, I worked hard on this slide. So what is the goal, goal of ventilation? So we're going to be talking more about blood gases coming up. But here's what I want you to know about it for now, okay? This is what you need to know. When we do blood gases, we are measuring the CO2, the balance of CO2 and O2 in the arterial blood. This is when you obtain the ABG or the arterial blood gas, and you're looking at those levels. We will learn to interpret those levels later in a later uh, week. But here's what I want you to know for now. The PaCO2, or the arterial carbon dioxide, should be between 35 and 45 millimeters of mercury, okay? The PaO2, or the arterial O2, should be between 80 and 100, okay? This is an invasive procedure because it involves sticking an artery, um, and it can have complications. So a, non a couple of non-invasive techniques you might look at so that you can measure and see where you stand for ventilation is the... Um, the um, oxygen saturation level, okay, using a pulse ox, and that is, should be greater than 95 if it's normal, okay, sometimes if they're abnormal, they'll let it be above 92, um, but you don't want it to run too much lower than that, so the goal is to have greater than 95 percent, it is a non-invasive test, uh, can be done without an order, and um, it is something that can be, uh, can be delegated to an NAP or assisted personnel because it is part of the vital signs, okay, and capnography is actually the measurement of 
um, the end tidal CO2. So the lowest point of expiration, what is at the end tidal, how much carbon dioxide is left, and that should be between 35 and 45. Okay. So let's talk about arterial blood gases for just a second. These are, um, like I said, this is invasive. You have to um, be trained to do this. And you're just looking at several values, and we'll be looking at those later. Like I said, we're going to be looking, it shows you the pH, the CO2, the PO2, and um, the HCO3 in the body. Uh, it also gives you an ox uh, blood oxygen saturation, okay? And it does have to have an order. It cannot be delegated. And if you remember, you have to perform the Allen's test prior to ABG. If you don't remember the Allen's test, you need to look it up and be able to perform it. That is where you occlude both the ulnar and the radial artery. And then you release the, until and have them uh, open and close their hand until their hand blanches. And then you release the ulnar artery and you look for it to pink back up really quick. And the reason for that is, is if you get an ABG and you go into the radial artery, you need to know that you have other collateral flow. Um, because if sometimes ABGs will cause the artery to spasm or if something happens to it, then if that's the only blood flow you have in your hands, they could lose their fingers, they could lose their perfusion to their fingers and um, essentially their hand would fall off, essentially. Um, so you need to make sure that you have that collateral flow before you start trying to stick into an artery, okay? Pulse ox, you know me and my babies, I gotta throw a baby picture in there somewhere. On babies, we get it in places like uh, on their foot, sometimes they'll wrap it around the big toe if they're a little bit bigger. Um, this is a newborn, they can actually go through the foot. And this again, this is not invasive and it can be delegated to nursing assisted personnel. And remember that um, we want it to be greater than 95%. So what kind of things can you think of that would affect a pulse ox measurement? Can you think of anything? It would be things like um, if their hands and feet had poor perfusion because they were cold maybe, or they um, just had poor perfusion. If, um, if their heart is beating too fast and the monitor can't pick it up, then they may not be able to measure the um, oxygen saturation. So it's important to make sure that your equipment's functioning well and that you know how to use it. Now, capnography is another way. Remember I, taught, I said that it's where you um, measure the end tidal CO2. So what's there at the end of the breath, what the lowest point the CO2 level is in your, in your lungs. And um, it should be between 35 and 45. Okay. And um, this is typically, this is not something you see a whole lot being done, but it is a non-invasive way that we can check for ventilation. Most of the time it's used when they're sleeping and they will... Um, they use it in sleep studies, and basically it has this little reservoir here, and it measures the CO2 um, in that reservoir when they breathe out. So um, a lot of times you see it used in conjunction with sleep studies, but it can be used other times too. Okay, so again, remember the factors that influence our oxygenation. We have developmental factors, lifestyle factors, environmental factors, physiological factors. So you have to remember all of these things when you start talking about how you're going to question a patient for their assessment history. Okay, so now we're switching over to how do we function and how do we look at oxygenation as nurses. So when we're attaining a nursing history, remember the subjective data is the data that the patient states. Those are the questions that you ask, the things that you ask to get an idea of what's going on. What are they presenting for? And if you look in the box on pay, uh, the box 41-2 in your Potter Perry text, that one has a list of open-ended questions. Some are open-ended, some are just yes or no questions about some different things so that you can get an idea of the things that you need to know related to oxygenation. You need to know um, what's the nature of the breathing problem? What brought them in here? Why did they come? Um, what are the signs and symptoms? Are they coughing? Are they wheezing? Do they, are, is it first thing in the morning? Is it, does it last all day? Do they have coughing fits that lead to vomiting? Uh, those kind of questions. How severe is it? Um, any predisposing factors? Do they have a history of asthma? Do they have a history of uh, reactive airway disease? Um, what kind of, what are some predisposing factors? Have they had all their vaccine? If it's a child, have they had all their vaccinations? Um, so that we can have an idea if we might be looking at some kind of infectious process. Um, and what effects do the symptoms have on them? Is it keeping them from eating? Is it keeping them from going out? Is it keeping them from walking to the mailbox? So what does the effect of the symptoms have on them as a patient? Then we move on to the physical exam. And remember back from health assessment, you're going to be examining anything that, um, that's related to the lungs and the heart, essentially. Uh, looking at your inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. Uh, I'll just be honest, we don't usually do a lot of percussion in the hospital. Remember that percussion is where, so that you can locate a consolidation um, and in, in absence of an x-ray. But most of the time in the hospital, you're going to have an x-ray uh, unless there's some reason not to do it. But you do need to know how to check for those consolidations. And remember that it's also percussion is the egophony, the proncophony, and the whispered petroliloquy that can also help you narrow down and find an area of consolidation or concern in the lungs. So you need to go back and review those. Make sure um, to look at those. Um, kind of giving you a, a, a ding, ding, ding there. So make sure that you look at those different things and remind yourself of how they happen. So 
basically it comes down to straight up ABCs. It's the ABCs of life support. It's air, airways, airway breathing circulation. Um, you have to check and look and see what's going on. Are they choking? Are they making any sound at all? Remember, if they're making, if they're coughing, then they're getting air in and out. It may not be enough, and you still need to seek immediate help. But they may not be choking for you to have to do the Heimlich at that moment. Um, remember that Strider is principally a inspiratory sound. It's most of the time what you hear um, uh, as an, on the inspiratory cycle, but it can be expiratory too in the late phases of some infectious processes. And anaphylaxis. This is very important. Um, if, think about anybody that you know. The most common thing you hear about are peanuts. People that are allergic to peanuts, and you know they open a pack. Somebody opens a pack on the plane, and then the person has an anaphylactic reaction. You need to look and um, kind of be aware of anaphylaxis because in the hospital, what could cause anaphylaxis? I mean, the most common thing is when you're given an antibiotic for the first time. That's why it's so important with the eight rights of medication to go back and reassess your patient and see if you got the right response. Um, I have given, I had a little boy one time that um, came into the hospital with maybe pneumonia or an ear infection. No, I think it was pneumonia. He came in, they ordered recephin for him. It's a common broad spectrum antibiotic. I gave it to him. It was infusing through the use of a buretrol. If you remember back, um, Ms. Beginsky showing you a buretrol. And um, it was infusing, and the kid um, was laughing, and we were cutting up and playing around, and he kept complaining of his ear itch, and he says, my ear itch, my ear itch. And so I looked in his ear, went out the otoscope, I looked in there, I didn't see anything, and so we joked around about maybe having ants in his ears, and it just kept getting worse and worse, and then all of a sudden it hit me that he might be having an anaphylactic reaction. So I stopped the antibiotic, I called the physician, and before I could get back into the room, he, with um, some epinephrine, he was wheezing and had broken out and hives all over, okay? So you need to be aware of anaphylaxis and how you would treat it. Okay. Um, most often it is treated with the use of epinephrine as an emergency or an EpiPen. EpiPens are very common and um, they've been in these a lot lately because of the cost of them. I carry one for my son who's allergic to nuts um, and it is for rapid use. So that, I mean, you just basically take it and um, for lack of better words, you just take the top off and you basically jab it in the thigh. It's, it's even made to go through like blue jeans, things like that. I'm going to show you a video in a second. Um, but it's delivering epinephrine. Now, the key to this, the key to anaphylaxis in your breathing is it causes airway constriction. The epinephrine is a short-term fix. The effects of the epinephrine will wear off before the body can process the antigen that's causing the anaphylaxis. So if you're giving an EpiPen or you're using your own EpiPen, you call 911 immediately because you're going to need more help than that one EpiPen. It's not going to fix it by itself. Okay? Very, very important. Um, the other thing related to airway assessment, not just inflammation, but also increased secretions. If somebody has a lot of, um, if they're having an airway difficulty, they may not be able to swallow. Um, there's a uh, childhood disease called epiglottitis that we essentially have eradicated because of vaccines, the Hib vaccines, the Haemophilus influenza B vaccine. And um, with that, the epiglottis swells and it, it impairs their ability to breathe. And so one thing that you'll see from somebody that can't breathe, especially a child, if they've got an obstruction or um, epiglottitis or even um, pertussis or anything that keeps them from swallowing, they're going to drool. Um, they're going to have a lot of secretions. They're going to have a lot of upper airway secretions that they can't get up So and out. So um, so those are very important to uh, monitor as well, especially in an attended or a comatose patient or a sedated patient. I want to take a second to show you a few things, okay? This is um, inspiratory strider at rest. This is croup. Notice this on inspiration. Remember, breathing out should be passive. Here, that is an emergency and it needs to be dealt with, okay? I, um, she is very reactive to smells and somebody has Watch how she reacts to the situation. <coughs> That's an EpiPen. The overall answer is yes. Okay. Now, remember we talked. <coughs> okay. The number one question I get asked about that video is, is it that immediate? Um, the overall answer is yes. Okay. Now, Remember, we talked about anxiety and how not being able to breathe causes you to be air hungry and very anxious. So um, that is a very important thing to pay attention to. Probably um, she was getting more anxious, which impaired her ability to breathe. But then as soon as she gave the EpiPen, she was able to relax just a smidge because she knew relief was coming. And so, but it works within a matter of minutes, seconds to minutes, um, epinephrine does. It's very fast acting in a severe case like that, but it is also quick to wear off. So again, um, you have to uh, get medical attention. So let's talk about nursing diagnosis. We talked about assessment. Let's talk about the D, you know, ADPI. Uh, let's talk about the diagnosis. So what diagnosis go along with that? So you have activity intolerance. If they're not oxygenating, they can't get up and walk around. So that may be one of the first things that they notice is that they're just not able to walk to the mailbox anymore, or um, they can't get out and play basketball like they used to, whatever. Um, decreased cardiac output. Obviously, decreased cardiac output will cause alterations in oxygenation. Um, fatigue may be related to the oxygenation. 
impaired verbal communication, if they're breathing hard, like that lady that we just watched, if something is impairing your ventilation, they may not be able to verbally communicate because you have to have air across vocal cords. And if you don't have air across vocal cords or you're spending every ounce of energy you have just to breathe, you're not going to be able to communicate, verbally communicate. Impaired gas exchange, I think that's the obvious one. Ineffective airway clearance, we talked about that oxygenation issues, alterations in oxygenation may be because of uh, secretions in the airway or uh, inability to clear the airway. Ineffective breathing pattern, make sure that you um, know the different breathing patterns. And we talked about puss malls and some of the other breathing patterns. So um, make sure that you are paying attention to whether their respirations are even and deep and if they are, um, if the patient perceives any issues with their breathing pattern. Risk for aspiration. If they're breathing real hard or they're coughing a lot, um, what would you do? You wouldn't want to be feeding them. Um, or if um, you know aspiration could be the cause of the alteration in oxygenation. Okay, so it just depends on what your patient's case is, and the interventions that go along with those again are going to depend on the individual, um, the individual diagnosis and case. Goals and outcomes. Okay, based on these are remember think all the way back to um, the to your concepts class and when you talked about the nursing process and how an ADPI, ADPIE, um, you know, we've been asking some questions on the exams related to nursing process. And so y'all need to probably go back and review those and kind of have an idea of exactly how that works. Remember that in the planning stage, your goals and outcomes should be based on your assessment and the nursing diagnosis that you've chosen. They need to be patient and family centered. Okay, so you need to involve them in planning. They have to be reasonable. It's not reasonable to set a goal that your patient can walk to the mailbox if they're waiting on a heart transplant and that's not going to happen until they get that heart transplant. Okay, so the goals have to be reasonable and they should have a defined time frame. So if you want them to um, maybe have their, ox their oxygen levels above 90% without oxygen by discharge, okay, it could be a discharge goal or, um, but there needs to be a defined time frame as to when those goals should be met. Okay, let's talk about interprofessional collaboration, okay? When you're planning these goals and these outcomes, obviously nurses and doctors, we collaborate a lot, okay? But who else can you call? Who are you gonna call? Not Ghostbusters. The number one person that needs to be your friend is your respiratory therapist, okay? Y'all have heard me preach this time and time again, 1-800-CALL-RESPIRATORY. Remember, they have a different scope of practice. They have a different perspective and um, they have some therapies that they can do um, as well. So remember to include the respiratory therapist when you're planning these goals and outcomes. What about the nutritionist? If they are too weak to take deep breaths because they're breathing so fast, maybe they need increased, um, uh, maybe they need increased protein, maybe they need increased calories. What do they need? But the nutritionist can definitely help that. Then physical therapist, let's get our patient up and move them. Let's move that pneumonia. Let's move that atelectasis. Let's see if we can open up those air sacs. Um, so let's employ our physical therapist, maybe even our occupational therapist. And family members. Family members are very important to include. We've talked about this a little bit before. If you think back to um, at the very beginning of the semester in the Harry Potter station, when we talked about, you know, family members can help you get your patient to use their incentive barometer. They can help you um, say what's reasonable or not reasonable. Maybe it's, they can help tell you what resources the patient has at home, those kind of things. So family members are very important to remember to use them, okay? Just make sure that, like the role clarity um, uh, picture I have up there that everybody knows their role. And so it's not, don't just assume that somebody else is gonna do it. Remember that the RN is the coordinator of care, okay? All right, now let's pause and think for a second. What would be a reasonable goal statement for a patient very important in a goal statement book? Not everything, um, just oral pharyngeal suctioning. Remember with suctioning, it's very important that um, that you're watching the heart rate, not get them out of the way. Um, good and going in your brain. 